Drs. Richard Carrier, Dennis R. McDonald. I'm going to be talking about on the historicity and we could definitely have Dennis chime in having a lot of fun. So I'm just going to read the question and take out of it and do what you will. This is the way I typed it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned in your book, um, Zechariah chapter three and six and other chapters that are talking about a rising Messiah named Jesus and Isaiah chapter 53 are potentially speaking about a legendary first temple figure and how first century Christians uh, would have easily seen this and possibly uh, applied it to their Messiah suffering, dying and rising Messiah, Michael, the angel, named rising that that word keeps coming up you know right right uh, can you elaborate on what, what yeah okay there's god there's a bunch of things in there um let me go backwards uh so the michael thing that's that's separate from the other things in daniel 9 or actually uh, daniel 12 it talks about the prince will rise and begin the apocalypse and and i think it i think it says michael i think it names it as michael identifies as this figure as michael um so there's two two levels of understanding here there's there's the the, the intention of the original authors, right, uh, which is one reading of the Bible. But when you look at the Peshers that are being instructed at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the logic of Pesher is to not think of what the original meaning was, but to think of what is the hidden meaning that God put in there that it speaks to us today. So they're reinterpreting every verse. So what, their interpretations are never going to be the original intention of the author. So, uh, so that I think people get confused between those two things. Um, Christianity is definitely built out of a Pesher. Paul frequently talks about like the scriptures, this, the scriptures, that. Like when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says, this, according to the scriptures, Jesus died to atone for sins and, and all this other stuff. Obviously, there's no passage in the Bible whose author intended to say any of that, yeah. right? Uh, so so what, they're, and what they're doing is not unusual. In, in Pesher logic, they have the exact same kind of sectarian thinking that the Christians are engaging in here which we see at the Dead Sea. So we know this was a Jewish thing. I have a whole article or a whole section in my book where I talk about this was a normal thing that they're doing. They're finding different meanings that they believe God has hidden in the text that were not the original author's intention. And their logic is probably even that when God spoke this to the original prophet, he intended it to mean both things, right? So he's, he's, he's expecting that prophet to not know what the secret meaning is, but it's also still an applicable meaning for the context. So they can even they could even say, if you were to argue with them, they would say, oh yeah, he meant both. That's the point, right? So um, so then there's, oh, but there's a secret meaning that's meant for hundreds of years later that, that applies to a different context. And so that's where they're getting all of this, this Like stuff. Christians do today. Right. And so the question, and this is really important that we're talking about material that is in chapters four and five of my book on the historicity of Jesus, which is only the background evidence. It, it, ha it doesn't have anything to do with evidence for the historicity or against the historicity of Jesus. Right. It's, it's only stuff that is true regardless of whether Jesus existed or not. That's the key thing. This is stuff that just is true. And some of those statements are possibility statements, not probability statements, where I'm saying it is a fact that it is possible that this occurred. So you can't argue in response that it is impossible. Uh, and then the question of whether it's probable relates to the evidence later, right? So the argument that I point out there is that, that we know pressure is a thing. We know Christians are doing pressure. Uh, so therefore, we, it, we can go at the text and think, well, if we're thinking like the Christians and we're looking for a pesher in the text, what could we find there? And remember, we don't have the Christian pesher, so we don't have the complete pesher that they put together. Paul occasionally drops a line in referencing scripture, like even in 1 Corinthians 15, we don't know what verse he means when he says, according to scripture this, according to scripture that. But he thinks some verse, right? So there's, they have some pesher that they've got either orally or physically <clears throat> where they've worked out all these verses that they're putting together like we see, like the Melchizedek scroll that we see in the Dead Sea, where you have a verse and then an interpretation, and then you have a verse from a completely different book in a completely different place about a completely different subject that they're linking to the other verse with a little commentary. And they just go and go and go. And so they build this whole, and in the Melchizedek scroll is the whole prediction that soon this Melchizedek space alien is going to come down and, and kick ass and, and defeat all of the demons and, and with his own angelic army. And all. they come up with this really bizarre stuff that is obviously in nowhere in the Old Testament is not intended. Uh, and they're finding verses that they think are relevant to this narrative in the weirdest places, not just Daniel, but they're finding it in Isaiah 52 and 53 as well. They're actually quoting some of the verses that the, uh, that the Christians were. Uh, and so they're, they're, this is how it's working. So in this context, we want to ask, like, can you find the gospel? Like, if we were to use this logic ourselves right. and they go there, could we do it? And so I have a few elements in there where I say, well, let's do this. Okay, yeah, look, we, look at that stuff we could find and we could put together. It's easy to do. Now, that doesn't mean that that is what they did. 
right? They could have done any other weird, crazy connection of verses. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I find some examples of some easy ones to do that would have been obvious to someone who thinks that this is true, right? That would, and show how easy it is to do to build this pressure out of here so that you could believe that this has been told you that this is going to happen before it even happens, right? So you don't need it to actually have happened is the key thing, right? It isn't necessary for someone to have watched Jesus die to have figured out that there has to be some dying Messiah, right? And which could also work in historicity's sake too, because you could think like, well, maybe Jesus figured this out and wants to go get himself killed That's, to like fulfill the prophecy, right? right? So you can totally use it in both senses. It does not argue for mythicism or for historicity. It works for both, or even and it is a fact. Dissonance where he right, dies and then they correct. rationalize and look at the scripture. Absolutely right. Yeah, that's my point. So this is a, this is a fact that is a fact. Irregardless, uh, and uh, and my point is, and so I do, a lot of these are just possibility arguments. They're not. I'm not intending to argue that it's what happened. We don't know what happened. We don't have their pressure. I wish we did. That would have been super useful. Um, so when we get to that, like like one of the passages I use for this uh, is, I say, well, look, if you look at Zechariah, well, first of all, let's say you think it's you're looking for Jesus. You're looking for a Messiah, uh, and so let's say you've decided you're looking for. Uh, make it easy. Uh, we'll say we're already decided we're looking for a dying Messiah. Let's say you read Daniel nine. And, the, and nine, you get to 9, verse 25 and through 27, and you say, okay, I think this is predicting a dying Messiah is going to presage the end of the world. Let's suppose you've decided this. It doesn't matter if that's what the authors intended or not. That's irrelevant. They were originally writing about Onias III and his death and so on. Uh, but that's not what these authors are thinking. They're thinking this is something, clearly the world didn't end after that, so that can't have been it. It must be something else. And so they're thinking of something else. So, they, so you've decided... Uh, and there's a, a universal atonement that's supposed to happen somewhere in Daniel 9. It talks about that. And then, and then it goes on and on and on. And then you get Michael comes and, 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 and Michael arises. It's a similar word. Uh, Michael comes up. Uh, and so if you see you're, you're putting all this together and you say, well, that, is that a hidden reference from God about a resurrecting superhero, right? Is this actually the anointed one that's being talked about in verse 9, right? <clears throat> so we're not saying that, that I can prove that that's the thinking they engaged in. I'm just showing that this is an easy... These are dots that are easy to connect, right? So let's do an easier one, one that's even more obvious than that, is where you get to Daniel 9, you've got the dying Messiah, and then some sort of atonement, you realize that there has to be an atonement for sin to, so that God's promise can be fulfilled, because God said if you, it's only when you stop sinning, only when sin is gone that I'm going to actually you know, come help you. So what if there's a universal atonement? What if that's what Daniel 9 is talking about? So if you do that and you go looking around and you think you know that your guy is named Jesus, Savior of God, right? Uh, if you know you're looking for a savior of God in there. So you're going to look at all these passages about these Jesuses that you think are kind of obscure. So like there's in Zechariah 6 and 3, there's a Jesus that appears in heaven. There's a Satan is arguing over this Jesus guy and God is in, in Jesus in the presence of God and Satan's arguing about him. And verse 6, he has, there will be a man rising. And then they, there's in, this same Jesus figure is mentioned in the same context. Now, the original meaning of Zechariah, Zechariah is talking about Jesus, the original, the first priest of the second temple, right? When the new temple was arised, the first temple priest was a Joshua, his name is Joshua uh, uh, ben Jehozadak. So he's like this. Now, that's whether that's historically true or not, but it was what was believed at the time. So uh, I'm assuming it's historical. Uh, so that's what Zechariah, he's talking about this priest figure who's, uh, you know, having some sort of halakhic experience and and you know, visit, having a vision of God or coming into the presence of God and learning secrets and so on, predicting future kings and things like that. So there's, like, there's a context for Zechariah. But in Pasher logic, it can't be about that, right? It's got to be about something else. And so you're looking at this and go, okay, look, there's a Jesus here, there's a Jesus here, uh, and he's going to be a priest, and there's going to be some sort of a universal atonement, and then the king is going to rise, and then there's going to be you know, salvation. So they're thinking, well, these might be his messages about our Jesus, right? So you can start connecting these dots. Uh, and if you look at that, and then you look at how Philo looks at this passage, and I have a whole separate section on that. Um, Philo looks at this passage, and he sees the rising figure, uh, the one who, who will rise. Uh, he has this whole allegorical explanation of this being the angel of all many names, who is the Logos and the high priest of God's celestial temple and the creator of the universe. And he's got this whole list of properties that he ties this figure into, which happen to be all the same properties of Jesus, the, the image of God, uh, you know, the son of God, the firstborn son of God, even the create God's tasked with creator and uh, God's guy who's managing the universe. Like all of these, these things that were attributed to Jesus, this is the same stuff, right? So the an angel of many names and Jesus are clearly someone at some point before Paul had decided Jesus and these, this angel are the same person. Now, you could argue, and I do argue in there, that it even looks like Philo thinks that the one that's actually called this is Jesus, uh, the Jesus figure. In the original Zechariah passage, 
uh, it looks like he, he, they, he might mean these to be different figures. Like it's possible that he's not meaning that. Um, that's convoluted grammar, so it's kind of hard to tell. But when Philo is talking about it, it seems like Philo is taking this as Jesus is the one who will be called rising. And then that connects to all the other things. Now, I don't think that I don't think that's proven, and so I don't put it in the like the evidence section. Right. I just have it in like here's here's an argument for how you could connect this dot real easy, and it looks like Matt Philo's already doing it. So anyway, this, this is all about like what's possible and how you could connect these dots, uh, and that's the key point of this. And it's, it's not like the, I have discovered the pressure of the Christians. I don't know. Like this is just one possible way, and, and just showing how easy it is to do. And if I can do this with these verses, there could be any number of verses that and would do the same thing. And you're saying they did do this stuff. So the fact that they, they did something, did, right? They yeah, did do there is some pressure that they did, right? So I'm just or... showing by proof of concept that how easy this is to do. Uh, and so that's that's how I use this material. Uh, if that answers your question, I'm not sure because yeah. there were many elements to your question. I'll say this: I'd like to hand it to Dennis to have his thoughts. I love getting his thoughts. It's so cool when someone doesn't agree even on the conclusions, mm -hmm. but can come so close in so many ways to what you're saying. When I was a Christian, um, I used to, when I read the Bible at, in high school, I took my second semester because I was flunking, smoking pot, and skipping class. And I was like, I got to come back. And I was really getting bright with the Lord. So I was reading Genesis. Right. And I started in Genesis, King James only asked at the time. And I was getting through the Old Testament. I saw Jesus all over the place. Places that the New Testament didn't even mention. Correct. Yeah. I mean, because like, I'm already in my mind working with, He's coming. Yeah. And I read this in my King James Version. Some of the notes, the translators back in these days said uh, they had this famous phrase. And it was so poetic and it, I, it meant something to me. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And I believed in that mantra. Mm -hmm. So when I went into the Old Testament, all over the Psalms, the suffering of David is really Jesus by yeah. his suffering. And like everything I'm hearing, I'm hearing Jesus. And I'm like... Oh my gosh. So it's so anachronistic, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, but yeah. it was like, it was coming to it's life for me in a way. your logic and you think it's inspired, right? When right. you were in high school, was your name Origin? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm not kidding because Origin makes that a part of his hermeneutic. Yeah. And when he reads the book of Joshua in Greek, the name Joshua is Jesus. And he reads the book of Joshua as a Jesus book. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You this is, that. this is my point. But yeah, so like that's hopefully summarized a, a yeah. brief answer here. Well, Dennis, please uh, tell us some things that have come to your thinking. Okay. I'm going to start out with something that really is facetious and it's not intended to be cruel, but you know, you, you want us to fight. So I, I, I don't really want you to fight, but I do want to hear differences. Yeah. yeah. Let's hear that. Yeah. I wish Paul was as smart as Richard Carrier. <laughs> So that's a backhanded compliment, I right. suppose. <laughs> the other is that I wish Paul had access to the Septuagint the way that uh, Richard has uh, absorbed the Septuagint. And um, Richard has to been be cautious. Clear, I don't necessarily think Paul is the one who did this. I think Paul is inheriting a pressure that was already built uh, by this point. Well, then they should have been as smart as you are <laughs> because um, I think... I'm convinced, and I think at some points Richard would agree with this, that often New Testament scholars oversell the influence of Jewish scriptures and see connections where they are not. Now, Richard was very careful to say, I want to show you how easy it is to make these associations. Mm -hmm. I could agree with that. The question is whether the ease of our making these associations would be would have been so easy for uh, early Christians, or if they did so, uh, uh, you know, is that sufficient explanation? Well, that's why you appeal to the Dead Sea Scrolls, where we see exactly the same kind of people doing exactly the same kind of thing, and they're making even more specious connections than I am. <laughs> no, I, I can grant you, you that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think the intellectual climate, even for Paul is much more Hellenized than it is Judaized, if I could say that way. And I'm going to give us a st statistic that Richard would agree with, but probably would want, we'd want to assess in a different way. In um, lists of literary papyri from Egypt from 200 BCE to 200 AD, which certainly includes the period of the, the, the Septuagint, we have five false, false small fragments of the Septuagint. We have over 600 of Homer. So the 
uh, early Christians are going to know their Homer out of school better than they know their Moses. And their Moses is what they're going to get in their synagogues. Um, and that now Richard is going to agree, surely, that Christian origins is um, a, a sociological hybrid. It comes out of Jewish scriptures and it comes out of Greco-Roman culture and its literatures. We agree on that piece. I think uh, we differ on how much weight we play on one corpus over the other and one and on a particular issue. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. You know, um, how that how that plays out. So it's it's more like a teeter totter than a, or a tug of war than it is a bombshell. So, you know, I, so I, we have a tug of war. Yeah, on some I, things. so I think like. Early Christianity, so we've got to distinguish gospel Christianity from early Christianity. Gospels don't exist yet uh, yeah, right. when we're talking about uh, the, the religion that Paul is buying into, basically. Um, we're already talking about a fringe community, so we're not talking about the average community. And they themselves are already going around saying, like, it's the, they have two sources. Like, if you look at Romans uh, 16, 25 to 26, they have two sources for all of this, teachings and the gospel of Jesus. They say revelation and scripture. And Paul's constantly saying, even no, no, he's I, repeating right. the creed, it's, it's, he's saying the first Corinthians according to the scriptures. According to... So Christianity is definitely built out about built out of the scriptures. It might not have built built out of the Septuagint originally. I mean, I think that might be Paul's transfer. That's uh, possible. But um, but it's certainly the same pressure, right? Uh, and I think uh, it's certain, Paul might have built on it, but it's, certainly he's inheriting one already. So definitely the ideas that Christian, and this is true even if Jesus existed, right? So this is not even I agree with that. Relevant. Yeah. So it's like he, let's say let's do one historicity scenario. Jesus dies, cognitive dissonance. They have to, reading the scriptures, looking for some explanation of what happened. And it dawns on them, they can explain it. If they, if they find this one pattern in there, they can explain it. And it, they, to them, it's like a revelation. And so they go around even claiming it's a revelation. Maybe they have a dream that Jesus comes to them and confirms this to them. And so now they're really reassured. Uh, but it all comes out of the scriptures, right? So it's, it, that's the kernel of Christianity. Now, what happens to it after that? When he gets, when Paul gets his hands on it, now he's like interjecting like Greek philosophy and other things. He's he's transforming it. He's growing it and you know nurturing it into a tree from a bush, right? Uh, but the core of it, the gospel and the primary teachings of Jesus, they definitely were looking at the. In Paul's case, they're looking at the Septuagint, well, and his and his congregations okay. too. Let so. me respond to that. I agree with that. Um, that what we have with the Septuagint at some point, and our Jewish scriptures generally is a contested authority among two sub two uh, agonistic subcultures that have a lot in common. In other words, it's yeah. a contested authority. Right. And so it's not impossible that you have this kind of imaginative exegesis to account either for the tragedy of Jesus's death or the, uh, the vision of a heavenly character and to say, what the hell does this mean? So that's uh, a possibility. Wow. Well, it sounds to me, regardless, I mean, you guys would agree with that. I think uh, your point was simply saying how much, I mean, how much scripture do they really have? They didn't have their whole Bible like we do, technically, so to speak. But um, I think it is interesting when you look at these passages and wondering, all right, historicity or mythicism, it doesn't matter. It can be explained any of these ways. However, if you do start going down a mythicist road like you do, I see how this could be easily an explanation for the development of the revelation of Jesus. If it's historicity, you can still do the same thing. So right, at the end yeah. of the day, this is just a cool <laughs> piece of evidence, no matter what you take. Yeah. And both of you, in using this data, it kind of explains where, like Christians always like to act like, oh, it's a real, you know how many prophecies Jesus fulfilled? 300 or more. And what are the statistics? You remember that dumb statistic where they said if you took a red coin and you went into the state of Texas and you filled it up with gold coins about a foot thick and you, you like took a person, blindfolded them, ran across the state of Texas, chipped this red coin out there and then like took some other person who was blindfolded and didn't know what they were looking at had them walk across the state of Texas and bend down and pick up one coin. The statistics are that they picked up the red coin. That's Jesus. Heard oh. <laughs> Have you ever heard this? That is the most elaborate 
weird analogy I've ever heard. No, I've never heard this before. They did like this measurement calculation <laughs> of statistics to act. It's the same thing with like fine tuning arguments. Yeah, yeah. Like. I, I, okay. I, what's an analogy too, though? Like, what what is the, the improbability? Point is Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies. I get you. Okay. The impossibility. I that see. He actually I see. All of these prophecies that Christians are looking at. Right. In the New right. It, it's it's a good example of a valid but unsound argument. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Is is like what's if that actually <laughs> happened. Yes, you, you have a logic there that the probability of it happening. Yeah. Other than by design would be low, but it, yeah. See, the, but and my, I want to say that would be in a way my criticism of you. That be, you're <laughs> smarter than the tradition is, because and but that's a criticism of my work too. Right. That I'm, uh, I know Homer better than early Christians did, and I see connections that just aren't there. It's, and it's so a concern, in both yeah. cases, we need to be more disciplined. And, yeah, that's and when you modest get beyond even. possibility and into probability then you need to start presenting evidence that, that this actually happened. And that, that's why, like, when I'm talking about the possibility, I'm talking about, you know, you've got the context of Philo, you've got the context of the uh, intellectuals at Qumran, and you've got the context of Paul himself referring to, like, they're getting all these weird things out of Scripture, just like the Qumran people did, just like Philo does. So I'm putting them, I'm showing that they, they would easily fit into this context of this kind of thinking. Uh, and so that you can't say that it, they didn't. Is right, the, and the I'm not thing. saying that. Yeah. If I might, with what you said, I thought was interesting as we wrap this up. You uh, just said, you know, sometimes people criticize your work because they think you're too smart, smarter than what the early Christians were. Uh, Justin Martyr, all these guys. Why didn't they see all of the Homeric stuff? I mean, we get brief references you can use and pull on. Ah, they noticed something, though. They noticed something. And that's true. Yeah. But like, how much did they notice? Mm. And that's that's the interesting problem I see is like, if they understood all that you now see being critical why aren't they bashing Matthew, for example? Why aren't they going, look, Matthew is clearly, and we all see this, like there's no one too smart in critical well, scholarship. It's, it's funny that you frame it that way because that really captures the modern fundamentalist mindset is that they would think that that's the response that you would have. Right. Whereas like back then, this would be, oh, well, it's clearly of God then, right? Because to them, it would be this would be reinforcing of their belief in the beauty and perfection of these documents that it has these perfect illusions and these perfect lessons constructed in this perfect way. Like they wouldn't see that as proof that their religion is false. They would see it as proof their religion is true. <laughs> uh, uh, or that their religion is better than the culture, Correct. Uh, than the religion of their neighbors. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and so for like me, I guess it's a different world, different software in the thinking, but like we all look at the gospels and we all see problems, right? Papius points out there's problems, but he talks about chronology. He doesn't really go into it and say, look, this is contradicting all of these others in that respect. But, right? but he does say uh, Judas Iscariot did not die when he hung himself. Okay. So he survived and then God had to kick the shit out of him, almost literally. Right. So, um, <laughs> in, so in that case, there is an internal critique in the tradition right. that it's not just, it's just not sequence. But the translators, in his view, botched it up in other ways, too. Okay. I just think it's interesting Like we, if we use that same critique you're pointing out to all scholarship that sees synoptic problems and really likes pointing out all these problems, the early church obviously didn't see all of these problems no, of that we all see. And so if, we, yeah. if they're blind to all that, what else are they potentially blind on? What you're talking There's about? Right. What you're talking about There's a number of things, though, that assumptions there, though, because we're talking about, you're talking about like Justin and these later Christians. Yeah. But by that time, they've lost almost all the actual tradition from the beginning. Uh, so like like they, they probably, the Christianity of their conception would might be in, indistinguishable or like, you know, unknowable to the original Christians. They're like, what on earth have you, what are you doing here? Uh, they would see some similarities, but uh, these are different people doing different things by that point because Christianity right. changes, That's just especially the, the secret oral law. That's going to change faster than anything because there's no way to control it. Yeah. Uh, you have public documents, you can, you can check it, but if there's oral secrets, well, it's, that's easy to change, right? And so it's going to evolve. And, and that's how you have all these sects with all these bizarre sub-doctrines that, that you get the heresiologists exposing all these bizarre, so-called bizarre teachings that actually are not, probably no more bizarre than the actual teachings of the orthodoxists because they have their own secrets. You know, Clement of Alexandria talks about the levels of secret teachings in the Christian church and he can't talk about, about them all and things like that. But I yeah. also find like you can't just immediately assume that all church fathers are the most 
brightest bulbs. I, I think Justin is not a bright bulb, whereas I think Origin is. Uh, you can tell the difference in their insights and their ability to like work with scripture and logic, very distinctively different. And so when you're looking at the, obviously the origins of Christianity had to have been in the hands of someone who was a genius. Obviously, that's how religions, I mean, I would even say that of Joseph Smith, like for, for all his uh, mistakes and, and so forth, like he was definitely, compared to other people of his time, he was a genius. Like he did things that the average person of his time could not have done. Right. Uh, and, but that doesn't mean that he's right, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean that, uh, but, uh, so it's the same thing as if you're going to go say, well, are you saying that, why doesn't Justin know this? Well, maybe Justin was never taught this and maybe Justin's not as smart as the people who invented it, right? So, and then Origen goes in and talking about the levels of knowledge based on how smart and knowledgeable you are. And he's saying that there are most Christians are not going to understand these things. They're not educated enough to understand them. And so it's, it's the people who are capable of going deeper, the hedgehogs, that can figure out uh, the deeper meaning of the scriptures. Those are the ones that Origen thinks are on his level, but everybody else maybe only takes from the superficial part of the scripture. So even Origen is aware that most Christians don't get this stuff. But right. then in, in some moments, Origen like reveals it. Like when he gets the Barabbas parable, like he, he totally gets the Barabbas narrative as the Yom Kippur and correctly even expands on, uh, he notices things in it that like other scholars, that modern scholars didn't notice. But, uh, so you, you can see this kind of stuff. So you gotta go looking, you just can't just assume that like Justin is your model of the smartest Christian or, or assume that he's gonna know all the secrets that were being taught a hundred years earlier, he won't necessarily. I want, I just, do we have what, three minutes? Yes. Yeah. The end of the um, Acts of Andrew, written at the end of the second century, has a colophon by an author. And there are relatively few early th Christian kalifa yeah. in which you have this uh, declaration of what he did. And I think I can recall it almost by memory. Here, let this stroke of the pen end my narrative. I trust that I wrote things down as I heard them. Both the obvious and also those things that are hidden, available only to the intellect. And I pray for all of my readers that they understand not only the things that are obvious, <laughs> funny, yeah. but also the things that are hidden. And I pray that God will open the ears of the reader, which is strange, the ears of the reader, mm -hmm. to enjoy all his gifts in Christ Jesus. And then you have a, a, a benediction coming at the mm -hmm. end. Here we have an author that says that he's writing a narrative that has two levels and one is available to those who have the dianoia, the intellect, and these things who are the ones that are hidden. The ones that are obvious are the ones that are available to everybody. And I think this two-pronged level of composition is more characteristic of literature than we usually know. And we know, in fact, in Greek literature, that people wrote both for the smart money and for the populace. Yeah, spot on. That's a really good example. It <laughs> really nails it. Yeah. And so, um, so we do have, by the way, I would say that our field tends to dumb down the reader instead of granting their sophistication and i think we do it be in a way because we want to feel superior to them i'll end with that <laughs>